So it's 502. I think it's a good time to get started. We've had some more people attend. I'm seeing some great engagement in the question section. So I just want to shout out the state of Texas, Ohio, uh, Florida, and Rhode Island. I see that we have some people from uh, those places uh, as well as Canada. So uh, again, thank you everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Richard Haig, Associate Director for Student and University Partnerships. Uh, on the presentation as well uh, is uh, our colleagues of mine in the admissions department. So if you were uh, late to joining the presentation, I highly encourage you to engage in the question section. If you have questions about uh, Ross University, the admissions process, or uh, general questions about the field of veterinary acupuncture, feel free to uh, put those in the platform and we will uh, certainly be able to address those towards the end of the presentation. But with that said, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Rachel Fuentes, uh, who is uh, so grace gracefully uh, joining us tonight uh, and she will take over the presentation and guide us through the slides. So Dr. Fuentes, if you are available, uh, feel free to hop on and I'm turning it over to you. All right, hi, can uh, can you guys all hear me okay? Yep. Awesome, all right, great. So hello everybody, thank you for being here. Um, I, you know, I'm thankful that you're spending some time with me on uh, in New York at least this beautiful day and um, Looking forward to talking to you a little bit about uh, veterinary acupuncture and sharing a case or two, going over some pictures and what it can do for us and for our pets and those animals that are not our pets and um, kind of just give you a brief overview. So uh, I guess we'll get started. And so kind of to begin a little bit about me, um, like I said, I'm, I'm from New York. <clears throat> I undergrad, I went to SUNY Delhi, which is the State University of New York, and I became a licensed vet tech. And after becoming a vet tech and working in practice, I uh, obviously subsequently graduated and then I got accepted to Ross. And I was at Ross and finished my curriculum there, which was a wonderful experience. I'd be happy to talk about that at another time. But um, I went through Ross and their vet prep program. And then after uh, my first few years at Ross, I did my clinical year at Kansas State University. Uh, and then uh, after graduating, I've practiced in uh, New York, in Florida, uh, and Connecticut in small animal medicine, so mainly dogs and cats with the occasional ferret, rabbit, so on and so forth, and uh, decided to go back to school and went to uh, the Chi Institute, which actually has, um, I guess, upgraded. They were previously known as the Chi Institute, uh, but recently they've changed to the Chi University. Uh, they offer uh, TCVM, which is traditional Chinese vet med, and other programs along with that. And so uh, kind of how did I get into TCVM and traditional Chinese vet med? Um, I have always had a fascination with uh, Eastern culture, and actually, uh, that's a picture. I got the opportunity to go with my mom to China. And so that's a picture of me on the Great Wall, uh, which was really cool. Uh, but also being a veterinarian and being in small animal practice, you know, you have these tools, you know, vet school and your clinical year give you tools to help treat and diagnose and work with your patients and your clients. And something felt like it was missing. After a number of years, you know, I wanted some more tools in my toolbox. Um, I had had patients coming that were typically speaking a little older, uh, arthritic. Some of them were post-operative painful. And, you know, we have great options with pharmacology, uh, which are wonderful, but we needed some more options. And so I went into TCVM for that. Uh, and so, as this says, what is TCVM? It's traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. In people, it's TCM, uh, or traditional Chinese medicine. And in animals, there are four branches. And our four branches are acupuncture, 
uh, we have the Chinese herbal therapy, uh, Twina, which is similar to like a medical massage and food therapy. In human medicine, there are five branches. Uh, that fifth branch is Tai Chi. Uh, however, we can't do Tai Chi with our pets. <laughs> uh, so if you can, I'd love to see it. We'd be big on YouTube. But uh, overall for TCVM, there are those four branches. And so with Eastern medicine and TCVM, it is built on this presence that in life, all things should be balanced. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when things are balanced, uh, the body remains healthy. And illness and um, imbalance create problems within the body. And so the goal is to maintain that. And balance in the body, along with in the world itself, is broadly, uh, managed by essentially the five elements. It's very Captain Planet, I know, <laughs> but it is uh, fire, earth, metal, water, and wood. And each one of these is associated with a season. It's associated with a color. It's associated with different organs, uh, personality types. Uh, it's associated with feelings and even things like taste and other emotions. So like, for example, um, our fire, you know, we see our big red one at the top, uh, the fire, fire personality, you know, those are going to be our pets, you know, and again, these are generalizations, but like our smaller, you know, maybe like a mini poodle, you know, kind of runs over to you because it wants the love, but then runs away because it's a little shy, but wants to be near you, but kind of gets nervous. It's That's the kind of that fiery energy. Uh, of, those are the animals kind of known as drama queens. You know, if you've ever taken your pet to the vet and it's like, oh, if you touch his foot, you know, he's just being a drama queen. Whereas our woody animals, uh, they are more, I think of, again, broadly, you know, I think of our, uh, like, little angrier chihuahuas that want love, but they are sometimes known as being a bit more aggressive or angry. Um, earthy animals are more, think, golden retriever, um, sweet, sometimes deal with obesity issues, um, nurturing, those kinds of things. Um, metal animals, you know, to me, I think of cats, independent, a little standoffish. Uh, they like quiet and uh, rule, you know, rules, uh, don't like change. You know, if you've ever had a cat and you move and then the cat starts urinating all over the house, uh, and then the water animals are typically a little more withdrawn. Uh, water is most associated with older or geriatric animals um, and those kinds of things. And there can be a mixture, you know, um, myself, you know, and it can change over time. So like myself, I'm like an, er I used to be an earthy wood kind of personality. The wood is getting a little better as I get a little older, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of the overarching basic of uh, the five element theory. And uh, much like this slide says, it, each element corresponds with lots of things. And when it comes to acupuncture, each one of those elements is associated with uh, essentially an organ system. And each of those organ systems uh, has a meridian or a channel that goes through the body. Um, oh, excuse me. And is uh, there are documented points that have been extrapolated over thousands of years, uh, and they are numbered points. So, for example, I think here I have bladder 25 or liver 3. Uh, and the reason for that, A, is so that if I see a patient and I'm going to uh, perform some acupuncture, 
and I place a needle, you know, in a specific acupoint, uh, such as bladder 25, and then that patient goes to see a different acupuncturist, veterinary acupuncturist, that person can look at my record and know exactly what I did, similar to uh, Western medicine, where your records need to be read easily by other professionals that are doing what you're doing. And so uh, there is a very clear way of documenting and repeating treatment when things are working well. And so, <laughs> uh, again, so it goes back to balance. And so ultimately, when these elements are out of balance in the body, we see illness, uh, whether it's a general malaise or lethargy, inappetence, or even things like allergies or uh, GI upset. Um, and combined with acupuncture and the three other uh, pillars, such as food therapy, Twina, you know, you're bringing, like I said, the balance back to the body and helping it help itself. So, all right. So, acupuncture. So, uh, first things first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the needles. So, uh, like I said, when we're doing acupuncture, there are points that are standardized points on the body. And those are acupoints. And so needles, all right, I have a couple needles here. So when, if you don't know, when it comes to uh, needles and gauges, those kinds of things, typically speaking, the bigger the number, the smaller the needle. And so if you're going to the doctor uh, or you're bringing your pet to the vet, and we are going to give an injection or pull blood, we're typically going to use something like this, which is a, a 22 gauge needle, okay? That's pretty standard, you know, seems a little big. I promise it's not that bad, but that's pretty standard for, for most injections. There we go. Uh, for most injections and those kinds of things. For acupuncture, the needles that we use, and this just has a little greed handle on it, this is the size of the needle you know that we use and this is a 34 gauge and so typically this is the size i use for most patients um however uh usually the biggest i go is about a 32 still much much smaller than this in fact i'll hold these two up together so you can kind of see the difference i don't know if uh there we go a little bit um you know, so the biggest I'll go is a 30 or 32, um, but they go all the way up to a 40 gauge. And so really very tiny. So you can put a needle, uh, whether it's a dog or a cat or a human, um, or all the way down to mice and squirrels. Uh, I do lots of rabbits. And th so those guys get smaller needles typically. So the smaller the animal, the smaller the needle. Um, and they're not hypodermic, so they are solid needles. So you don't have to worry as much about things like creating a pneumothorax where there's outside air getting into the thoracic cavity or where the, the, the chest is. Uh, everything is, of course, sterile. It's all one-time use, you know, uh, and no, none of, none of it should be reused for other animals. Um, so acupuncture, what are the kinds of acupuncture that are out there? And because there are different techniques that you can use. And um, I kind of listed these in the um, order that I use them in, you know, from most often to least often. So we'll start with dry needle to electro acupuncture uh, to amoxibustion, <clears throat> aqua acupuncture, and then hemoacupuncture. And I'll go through each one of those individually. And so dry needle is the one, this is Alice. <laughs> uh, I love working with Alice. Uh, her, her needles are just pink. Those are a little bit bigger. She's a bigger dog. Um, and she just kind of gets acupuncture drunk. And so uh, it's, I always love looking at her and, and loving on her. But uh, so dry needle. <clears throat> 
dry needle is essentially the acupuncture that most people think about when they think about acupuncture. It's where you place your needle, it goes into the skin, and that's it. It sits there, it stimulates the point uh, for between 15 and 45 minutes, you know, or so. No other adjunctive work is done with it. You place the needle, you leave it, and then you take it out after the session is over. Dry acupuncture, or excuse me, dry needle is very common. We use it in uh, most many of our animals. Um, they use it a lot in people. And again, it's, it's the most common thing that people think of when they think of acupuncture. Uh, and then the second most common thing that I use is electro acupuncture. And so this is Valentine and um, I use a lot of electro if we're going to be dealing with patients that have bony issues, painful issues, um, arthritis, or um, if they've had surgery, especially, oh, excuse me, especially if there's a patient that's had back surgery, uh, such as uh, like a dachshund that's had intervertebral disc disease and had slipped a disc and had a, a hemilaminectomy. Uh, and so post-surgical, I will use uh, electroacupuncture. That's been shown to really kind of amp up the endorphins and increase pain relief and um, extend the duration of action uh, for the patients that it's used in. The uh, electro unit is hooked up directly to the needle. So it's inserted into the skin and then it's attached. So this piece will be in the in the skin. And then the little alligator clip gets clipped right onto the needle portion. Um, and then that sits there, the machine gets adjusted. Each patient is different. There's a different um, frequency that's used. Um, and then that's usually between 15 and 20 minutes, between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, and so again, I use it a lot in arthritis. I stay away from it for the most part. Uh, if there are any neurologic changes, I have one patient who will actually, ooh, sorry about that, who will actually talk about a little later, PD, that I did use it in, uh, even though he had some neurologic changes. But typically, I stay away from uh, electro if there's uh, any history of neuro changes. Uh, I don't necessarily want to introduce electricity into a system that's already having um, dysfunction with those electric impulses. I also won't use it if the patient doesn't like it. Each patient is different. I have some dogs, I have one dog, it's a, he's a big old German Shepherd. I put my needles in. If I attach those uh, electrodes, he is off to the other side of the room, wants no part of it. And then as you just saw, Valentine sits there and lays there and is like, this is great. This is, this is, you know, this is gravy. So uh, if they don't like it, I don't use it. It's not worth it. Um, and then we go from there. Uh, so next is Moxa, Moxa Bustion. And uh, as you can see, this person is holding it. They're outside. So typically it's done outside. And actually, so this is, I have one of the Moxa rolls here. This is how they come. Uh, they are rolled mugwort. Okay, and the reason it's done outside is very honestly, it smells like pot. <laughs> and so if you're doing it in the animal hospital, uh, you want to make sure that the staff and the clients uh, and whomever else is in the facility knows what you're doing and that they're okay with it. Uh, because it is a smoky herb <laughs> and also can set, excuse me, set off the sensors. And so many times if I'm doing it, I'm doing it outside or in a well-ventilated area. And what you do is this gets lit. This is a new one. Uh, this gets lit uh, and then blown out much like an incense stick. And um, when the needle is in, you wouldn't do it with a plastic one. You'd do it with a metal one fully. Uh, this then comes down and essentially next to it, heats up the needle. Uh, 
and brings warmth and heat down into that acupoint to help, again, stimulate it. Uh, works best for um, disorders of cold, you know, or very elderly animals, great in the winter. It's not something I do a whole lot in summer um, because typically, again, it's warm and um, I don't necessarily, the goal again is to balance. And so if it's warm and the animal is warm, I don't necessarily want to add more warmth to the system. And so um, the animals that really benefit cats really seem to like it. Um, cats, however, can be very sensitive to smells. Um, and that's true of many smells, uh, many essential oils, plugins, those kinds of things. And so if it's going to be used with a cat and other animals, definitely fan it away so that it's not all in their face. Um, but again, cats, older animals, and um, again, only in scenarios where the people within the facility are aware. <laughs> um, next, we have acu, excuse me, aqua acupuncture. And so here I've got some pictures of some B12. B12 is naturally red. And so we use this a lot uh, for our patients that have a little bit of a, a smaller window or if we want to have a longer acting effect. The B12 gets drawn into a regular syringe. It's diluted with some sterile saline and then injected uh, into those appropriate acupoints, whatever acupoints you choose for that particular therapy. And um, you typically, for me, if I'm using dry needles, I will use anywhere from one to about 15 needles, give or take. If I'm doing aqua acupuncture, there's I'm I'm not doing anywhere near 15 aqua acupuncture points. Um, usually there's like two, two or three. Again, it's it's really more for our patients that have a smaller window of opportunity. You know the 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 dogs and cats that will let you work on them, and they're like, okay, I can deal with this, and then. All of a sudden, it's like, I've had enough. You can't touch me anymore. <laughs> you know, I want to eat your face. And so in those patients, um, I will use aqua. Uh, the B12 acts to stimulate the point a bit as an irritant. Um, and so the other time I will use it more regularly is there's a point called on Shen, and it's behind the ears. And when that is stimulated, it can be stimulated through uh, acupuncture, through uh, acupressure, through aqua acupuncture. That's a very relaxing kind of a point. And in many patients, if you inject a small amount of B12, you know, with sterile saline uh, into those points, it can really just kind of chill them out, make them feel good. And, um, so I'll use it a lot for that. I'll use it for our unhappy creatures. Again, the ones that will let me work with them for a little bit and then they've had it. <laughs> and that's that. Um, next is the hemoacupuncture. Uh, now, hemoacupuncture, very honestly, I don't do very often. Um, for me, if I'm going to use hemoacupuncture, Typically, I'll stick with the B12 instead, and that's just personal preference. And so with hemoacupuncture, you actually go in and you collect a blood sample from that animal, okay? And then you take that sample and you inject that into the point. And again, that is going to work as um, a stimulant uh, or an irritant for the point. Uh, again, for me, I tend not to use it very often because if I'm going to have the staff um, help restrain a patient for blood draw, they're getting uh, upset, you know, getting poked is not fun uh, for any species, you know, and so I'm trying to keep the uh, stress level to a minimum. So I tend not to use it. 
And so what does it do? What does it do? Why are we doing the acupuncture? Why are we doing TCVM? You know, kind of what's the point? And uh, in the Eastern side of things, um, again, we want to balance. We want to help the body help itself, so to speak. Um, we're going to allow chi to move. And chi is essentially uh, a life force. You know, it travels with the blood. You know, you can't live without chi the same way you can't live without blood. You can't live without chi. And if there's a stagnation or a stoppage of that chi, then you get discomfort, you get pain, you get issues, you get imbalance. And so it allows that chi to move, but it also calms the shen. And shen is essentially like the spirit, the mind, uh, you know, and, and how you feel. And so the goal again is to calm the shen, be, be relaxed, be in a place of less stress, allow that chi to move, be balanced, you know, and allow the body to heal. Now, from the Western side of things, because again, you know, I'm, I'm a, a Western veterinarian. I was trained, uh, you know, at Ross. I went to K-State, you know, it's all, um, it comes back to also what can it do on paper? And there have been more and more studies being done uh, with acupuncture and what it can do. And um, these are just two of them. It creates um, endorphin release. And so we see pain, um, a lessened pain response. We see increased uh, healing uh, or speed of healing, I should say. Um, there have been studies that show that white blood cells will increase after treatment. So things like infection are fixed a little bit quicker. Um, inflammation goes down a little bit faster. Um, there are some studies that have been positive for nerve regrowth and regeneration. Nerves grow very, very slowly. <laughs> um, and they still grow very, very slowly with acupuncture and other TCVM modalities. However, uh, there's been some promising work showing that they're growing a little bit faster. And so by doing acupuncture and having these research studies put out by reputable uh, sources, we're learning every day that uh, TCM in people and TCVM in animals really can give us benefit, not only on the Eastern side of things, but also uh, from a more traditional Western side of things as well. And so what do I treat? What do we do? You know, what cases would benefit from acupuncture? Um, and the answer is a lot, <laughs> just about anything. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, patients that have arthritis, uh, a lot of patients that have ligament issues, like our dogs that have cruciate uh, ligament ruptures, you know, or back pain, back issues, uh, patients that are high stress, high anxiety, because again, we want to calm that shen. Um, oh, excuse me. Inflammatory issues. Um, Again, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of using both Eastern and Western medicine together um, because both are great individually, but when used together, they really just, the results just explode with how good it can be. Um, again, when it comes to healing, whether it's uh, post-surgical, again, I think of I think of the dog that's had back surgery, the IVDD, the intervertebral disc disease dog, you know, that's had spinal surgery, versus the dog that's been hit by a car. Whether that pain is a surgical pain or a traumatic pain, acupuncture can help decrease that pain, increase speed of healing, uh, decrease inflammation. 
uh, decrease uh, potentially the need for analgesics or pain meds um, and increase response. So uh, lots of things, lots of things. And so uh, what does this do? What is it? It's quality of life. And at the end of the day, that's the goal. That's my goal. As a veterinarian, my goal is quality of life for the patients that I see and um, that bond that they have with their people. And um, I think it's fabulous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit here about PD, all right? So. PD was one of my patients uh, earlier on. Um, and so a little bit about him, he came to me, or I should say I went to him. Uh, the primary question and issue was that he had been having seizures and he was kind of maxed out on all his meds and uh, his owner had questions and wanted to see what else we could do. So a uh, little bit of his background. So Petey, he's a 12 year old male neutered Chihuahua. Um, he was very woody, you know, so he was a, a, a wood personality. Um, again, history of a seizure disorder documented. Uh, he also has a history of rectal prolapse upon defecation. It had happened his whole life, um, but still good to note. He's currently on, on phenobarb, zonisamide, Keppra, uh, which are all three are anti-seizure meds, uh, joint supplements, uh, flea tick, heartworm prevention, and fish oil. So he's on all the right things, you know, uh, from the Western standpoint. And so uh, speaking with Petey's owner, the biggest thing was, hey, Let's see if we can get him off of some of these meds. He's dopey, he's falling over, and every time we try to wean him down, he has a seizure, and we wanna try something else. And so I did my exam. Overall, you know, he had dental disease, many teeth missing. He was muscle wasting in the hind end uh, and with moderate ataxia. So he was walking like he was drunk in the back. Okay, and so we started, there's Petey. <laughs> oh, the Petey. Um, so as you can see, he's got his needles in and um, ugh, he just makes my heart smile. Um, and so we started our treatment. And so from the beginning, we started with, first we started with dry needle. Like I said, I didn't start with electro uh, till later in the, um, treatment plan. But, um, you know, after our first session, there really wasn't much of a change. Um, he still, excuse me, was on his meds and all those kinds of things. Uh, traditionally speaking, you should expect at least three to five treatments uh, before you see a, a change, especially if it's a chronic issue. So I really wasn't expecting after the first treatment to see a change. However, uh, the owner relayed back to me that the rectal prolapse wasn't happening as often, which I thought was really cool. So we're bringing strength and um, potential nerve improvement to that lower GI. Um, after our second session, we added in some some herbs, some Chinese herbs, and that was the Deton Tang. And um, since I was or am uh, further away from PD and where they're located, um, I also had him see a colleague uh, to kind of keep an eye between, you know, make sure that everything was going the right way. Uh, another TCVM colleague, and uh, to kind of have a, a second hand with monitoring him. And so we kept seeing each other, and then um, over time, he was really improving. He became happier, he was bouncing around a little more, and we were actually able to start weaning down his phenobarb. And so uh, we weaned and weaned over time. You know, you never wanna go too quick, and that's whether there's TCVM or not, especially when it comes to seizure disorders, you don't wanna discontinue medication quickly. Um, 
but we were able to uh, wean down his medications pretty significantly over the course of his treatment. Um, his outlook got better, his uh, mobility got better, um, he became a little more bitey, <laughs> which I say with love, you know, towards me, uh, you know, like I said, a little woody with that. Um, but obviously we were able to place all of our needles and it was great. Um, and so over time, again, we were able to decrease his meds, uh, decrease the seizure medication. He really uh, did not have very many breakthrough seizures at all. Um, unfortunately, with time, there were other things that um, came up and ultimately, you know, and sadly, Petey is no longer with us uh, for reasons completely separate from his seizure disorder. And I really feel like we gave him a quality life, you know, with uh, great goals and, and he did very well for a long time. And so I think back to Petey and his case uh, very fondly. And so um, I think next, yeah. So uh, this is Haley. Haley is a beagle and um, I included her picture because she is the dog that made me believe. Uh, coming from Western Med, again, traditionally trained or conventionally trained, I should say, uh, conventionally trained DVM, you know, there are things with uh, TCVM that sound potentially a little like mm, unconventional so to speak, you know? And so I was going through my coursework and I was at the Chi Institute or Chi University and uh, I'd been studying and learning and I had Haley coming in to see me. She's one of my regular patients and she was an older, I'd say probably about 13 year old beagle and she had all the badness, unfortunately. She had cancer and she had dental disease and she had all sorts of badness. And one day her owners called me and said, she's not eating. Something is really wrong because she is the dog that eats everything. And if she's not eating, then we have to do something. And she was already on her steroids and she was on mirtazapine, which is an appetite stimulant. Uh, she was on all the things, the owners were doing all the things. And I said, you know what, I'm in this class. I've learned a few points bring her in. Let's see what we can do, you know? And so they bring her in and I was able to get one point, one needle in her. And it's right here on the nose. And um, it's an uncomfortable point. So that's why I was only to get one. <laughs> However, it stimulates the appetite. And I put the needle in and they took her home, you know, and she ate. She ate her snack, she ate her dinner, she ate her breakfast. And they called me essentially crying with joy. And again, that was the moment that it was like, this, this, this is real, this is legit. You know, this dog, we can help by placing a needle. And so I, I, I think about her, you know, and really how she was instrumental in my learning and understanding and drive to continue with TCVM because it can sometimes seem a bit unconventional, but I guarantee it works. Uh, and so I believe, yes, so now we're going to talk a little bit or give you the opportunity to kind of... Uh, stretch your brain a little and see maybe what you would do. And don't worry, there are no wrong answers overall, you know. And so uh, a couple cases. Uh, our first one is we have a 15-year-old female spade lab. Uh, she's laid back and calm, very earthy. Uh, she had a cruciate rupture. Uh, of her left leg when she was eight. Her owners got it surgically repaired, healed well, no big deal, doing great. Uh, and on exam, 
She's overall unremarkable and healthy, but she does have a decreased range of motion uh, at hips. I'm sorry, that should say her hips, uh, her hips and her knees, and there's crepitus, which is that creaking and crunching of the knees and hips. And so what would you pick? What are your choices? Take your time. <laughs> All right, good answers, good, good, good. So yeah, so uh, about dry needle electro or about even, um, typically I would go for electro in her case as long as she liked it. Uh, dry needle is also a great answer. Dry needle is kind of never the wrong choice. Um, moxa, potentially, I did say it's used in older animals. So that is a good guess uh, for her since we were doing it in, her owner's home. Uh, we decided against moxa uh, just because, again, smell, <laughs> smell and smoke. But yeah, so I would have gone with electroacupuncture. Great job, great job. So number two. And like I said, there's no real wrong answer here. So, all right. All right, so number two, like I said, if, if you guys didn't hear me essentially for that last one, I probably would have gone with the electroacupuncture as long as she liked it, but dry needle was a great response. Never kind of a wrong answer. Uh, Moxa, also a good answer as long as we're not seeing heat signs. And again, I just didn't use it because we were inside her owner's home. So. Great answers. So number two, uh, we have a five-year-old uh, male neutered pity. Um, and he's a sweet bug when you're not doing anything to him. Uh, and, but he has a window of opportunity that uh, you can start looking at him and start messing with him. But if you go too long, he has had it and tells you he wants no part of it. Oh, excuse me. He has chronic itchy, itchy skin. Unfortunately, lots of our pities do. Uh, he's moderately managed on his apoquel and cytopoint. What would you pick? Wow, awesome. Overarchingly, we got the aqua acupuncture. Good job. Again, uh, I think you guys are so good. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. For this particular patient, I would use the aqua. If I know I have a short window, then I want to hit the most impactful points with the longest acting modality that I can in the window of opportunity that he's going to let me do it. Great job. Great job, good job. All right, last one, <laughs> last one, I promise. You guys are doing great. Uh, so this one is a two-year-old male intact Yorkie and he is a stress ball, okay? High anxiety when his owners step away or when they're in a different room. And more importantly, when people come over to the home. Uh, the exam is overall normal aside from the fact that he needs to be neutered. <laughs> Where would you go from here? All right, great, great, great. So Again, I would probably go for dry needle. Um, 
only because again, if he's high stress, you know, I think dry needle in addition to counter conditioning or behavior therapy, this is one of those patients that would work well again, combining Eastern and Western. But for me, I would go dry needle. Great job guys. Great job. Yeah. You know, and there really is no wrong answer, you know, um, again, there's no hard and fast rule. Every patient is different. Each situation is different. Um, it's what they need, but also what they allow. Um, if you have to force it, or if they're freaking out, or if you just get bad vibes and you're like, this is not right, <laughs> something is not right here, then stop. It is not worth it. There are other modalities that you can try, you know, such as, like I said, Twina, which is that medical massage. Uh, there's acupressure where you're still applying, you're using those acupoints, but you're applying pressure to those points. Um, there are other things you can try. So good job, good job. <laughs> and so I've been talking a lot about dogs, lots about dogs. I love dogs. I love cats, but um, there are other animals out there. <laughs> and so uh, what other animals can be served with acupuncture? Well, uh, here we've got, uh, we have an African sulcota tortoise, tortoise that I'm doing some acupuncture on. Uh, we were bribing him with some pears just to keep his head out. As you can see, I use a little bit bigger of a needle for him just because their, their skin is so thick and leathery. Uh, and then here on the right, uh, there is a, a smaller uh, bull python. Uh, it was the, I, she's a butter uh, morph, butter morph, her coloring. Uh, her, her name is Danger Noodle. <laughs> uh, and you can see her tiny, tiny little needle is right in her head. Like we didn't pith her, obviously she's alive. Uh, but again, so they really vary in size. That needle in her, in the Python is a size uh, 40, a gauge, 40 gauge. Whereas the one in the tortoise is, I believe that was a 32. And so again, you can see the vast difference in size for the different kinds of animals. They both did great with their acupuncture, by the way. Uh, and then so here we've got on the upper portion, uh, there's Lainey, that's the cat, because I, I really didn't talk much about cats. Cats can do great with acupuncture. Lainey is another one that I just love working on because she just... Mm, you know, you can kind of see the uh, the zen in her face, you know. And so uh, Lainey, excuse me, she's actually a three-legged, she, she's the three-legged variety. And so uh, when I work with her, her owner says it's almost like charging her batteries, you know, that she kind of gets depleted. We do our acupuncture and it's, you know, she gets recharged, so to speak. And then here are these bottom three. So on the left, we have a little squirrel, actually. This was a squirrel that fell out of a tree. And so uh, one of the hospitals that I was visiting for acupuncture um, was rehabbing him. And so that's our squirrel. In the middle, we have a turkey. <laughs> that's Linda, <laughs> Linda the turkey. Uh, she was in, she's actually, uh, she is a pet. She's not for eating, obviously. Uh, she was more of um, stress um, because unfortunately her partner had passed. Um, and so we decided to do some acupuncture for her. She did great. Uh, and then all the way to the right, that is, I call him Arnold. I don't, I don't think he, <laughs> you know, I don't think that was his real name, <laughs> but Arnold is an albino wallaby, uh, who was in, uh, and he had had some surgery performed. And so, uh, really you can see the vast difference, whether it was the African sulcata tortoise, the python, again, we have our squirrel, the turkey you know, all of them. Oh, and up here in the upper left, that's Arnold again. He's got that needle right in his nose. <laughs> He's a good man. Um, and then on the left again, we have um, our lemur, 
Lemur did not have a uh, traditional name that I learned. Uh, the lemur came from one of the local zoos, not a personally owned pet, um, who had gotten into a fight with an enclosure mate and had broken the arm, his arm, his left arm. And so, um, again, doing great with his acupuncture. Um, upper in the middle, we've got our honey bunny, you know, lots of rabbits respond fabulously to acupuncture. Many times we do it a lot for their back, for their back legs, hips and knees. Um, in the middle bottom, that's Bubs, that's Bubbles. She had been hit by a car in Jamaica. Um, and so was brought over to the States, was kind of a rescue case. And she actually is a double amputee in the back. And so that's Bubs. And then over to the right, I just thought this was very cool. This is actually not a dog. I use this picture with permission um, that one of our colleagues worked on at the Iditarod. And the Iditarod is that big, huge race, you know, I believe it's in Alaska, you know, uh, or obviously some are very cold. And so these are working uh, sport animals being, you know, an acupuncture is being used for treatment and recovery. And I just thought that was, I thought that was nifty personally. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so you can do acupuncture on any kind of animal as long as they're willing and able and uh, will allow an exam. And so aside from the cool things of like working with these, these pets and these some non-pets, these other animals, uh, why? why? Why learn it? Why learn about it? Why offer it? Um, it gives people options it gives people options. Uh, there are lots of reasons that people want adjunctive medicine, um, whether it's because we want to decrease the conventional meds that they're on or the medications they're on aren't cutting it, whether it's pain or allergies or what have you. Um, you're giving them choices, you know, and by you being educated on it, you're able to spread that knowledge and offer those services. And they don't have to leave you to find it. Um, it's appropriate. It's appropriate good medicine. Uh, the World Health Organization is putting out or has put out, you know, it's already almost at the end of that 10 year, excuse me, or nine year plan, uh, uh, essentially an incentive for human medicine to start including more and more um, acupuncture and traditional medication, excuse me, traditional medicine in conventional general practice. And so it's really becoming part of the general medical field. Um, working with Chinese herbs is on the table to become diplomat status. And so essentially that's like if you see a boarded surgeon or you see a boarded dermatologist you may soon be able to see a person that is boarded in Chinese herbal therapy. Uh, but also it provides peace of mind to the people that come to you, you know, that know you are learning and growing and trying to do the best you can for them, for their pets, for whether they're working animals uh, or zoo animals, that you are being a well-rounded practitioner and um, offering the best medicine that you can for that quality of life for them. And uh, that's about all I got for right now. <laughs> Uh, you guys can always, you know, check me out uh, on Instagram or Facebook more often Instagram these days. But thank you again for your time and um, happy to be here. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fuentes. And we did have a lot of great questions come through. Uh, I think we may go over six o'clock by a few minutes, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, uh, good, good. Uh, and I'll say uh, just... Uh, to preface the question section, I, my heart melted when I saw the picture of the squirrel, and then I had a heart attack with the boa constrictor, or <laughs> python, or whatever it was. So um, much applause to uh, what you do. 
Um, but we did have a question come on, uh, come through early in the presentation about horses or uh, other equine. And I, I noticed that it wasn't a part of your um, slides there at the end. Do you have any experience working with horses? Yeah, oh, horses, horses and cows love their needles. Um, I personally, unfortunately, don't have a lot of experience with horses, um, only because of where I, I mean, I'm from Queens. I didn't grow up around too many horses. I really didn't work in equine practice, but horses love acupuncture and they respond very well, um, whether it's uh, inflammation from laminitis, uh, you know, recovery from colic or other GI surgery, horses can respond wonderfully. In fact, there are some horses um, when they're going to be going for shows, sometimes they'll do um, acupuncture to help kind of lift, you know, the, the rump a bit to make it more um, appealing to the judges, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, horses do great with acupuncture. Okay, great. And for those of you who are joining us or maybe joined after the introduction, I just want to remind everyone we have Dr. Rachel Fuentes here. She is a Ross University School of Veterinary Medicine graduate. Uh, she went to school, uh, undergraduate college in New York State, uh, came to Ross University, did her clinical rotations at Kansas State, and then went on to uh, get additional education at uh, the Chi, Chi University, previously known as the Chi Institute. Uh, and um, just as we're talking about your continuing education, we did have some questions come through about uh, doing education beyond your DVM. So specifically, uh, how long did it take? You know, how much time did you devote to it after you came out of Ross and earned your DVM? Sure. Uh, so I believe it's been a it's been a couple years at this point, uh, and I was working. So after I graduated and all of that, I've been working kind of uh, essentially the whole time. And so I did my chi uh, chi university study while I was working. Um, part of it is didactic online. Part of it you do travel to go to the university itself and do hands on wet labs. I think for my acupuncture course, I. I think it was like a year and a half. I believe it was either, it was about, we'll say two years or less, right in that two year mark. Um, they have additional courses on the other uh, pillars. So there is a nutrition, you know, a, um, a food therapy course. There is a Twina course, which is that medical massage. And then there is the Chinese herbal therapy, which is similar to taking pharmacology over again. And so uh, it's, it's legit, it's, it's work. You put in the time and then there's a case study at the end um, where you present a case that you've been working on as well as um, there is practical testing and um, written testing. And uh, yeah, so I'd say probably a little less than two years, the didactic portion, the flying there portion, this particular one is in Florida, um, the testing, the case study. Yeah, I think it was worth it. I think it was totally worth the time. And actually, yeah. I believe um, Ross, and I could be wrong, I could be wrong, I don't want to talk out of pocket, but I believe there are, you've started potentially working with the Chi Institute and the Chi University, and that it may be um, something that students can start looking into while they're currently in school, um, just because I had a uh, a previous mentee who went to Ross and has since graduated and she went through the program while she was at, at Ross. So it may be something that you can do while you're in school, but you'd have to ask specific, more specifically to the people that know. Okay, uh, well, going back to your time at Chi University, uh, mm -hmm. is it something that's customizable or is the curriculum pretty standard uh, and you go through all of the content and you're tested on it at the end? Uh, pretty standardized. Yeah, no, and it's, um, they're in semesters. And so okay. like, I'm looking, I have my different binders. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. And so each semester is a couple of months. And so it's, it's, it's standardized if you need to take time. So let's say something happens or our life changes, you can step back and, uh, 
take a pause and then rejoin where you've left off the next time that club that course is offered so yeah they work on a semester basis okay and we had a question come through uh it's i just want to get your take if you have one um about uh physicians who practice in chiropractor uh, chiropractic medicine mm -hmm. um and may have be certified in animal chiropractic practitioner I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, uh, but do uh, chiropractors of animals have the authority to provide uh, acupuncture treatment or would they need to do continuing education? Um, lots of variables there. So if you are a human chiropractor or a, a chiropractor that works on humans, I should say, <laughs> if you're a person that you're a chiropractor that works on humans, there are courses that you can take to do chiropractic on animals. If you are a veterinarian and if you are a human chiropractor, you are not eligible to practice acupuncture. Only veterinarians are eligible to practice acupuncture, not vet techs, not human medicine, got to be a veterinarian. Um, if you're a veterinarian, you can take chiropractic courses to learn how to do chiropractic work on animals. Also, obviously you can take courses to work and learn about acupuncture for animals. So uh, if you're a human, if you work on humans, uh, there are ways that you can learn about doing chiropractic for animals. However, acupuncture is off the table. Okay, so as a disclaimer for anyone in the audience, do not practice animal acupuncture unless you have reviewed the licensing requirements in your state. You got it. <laughs> uh, so another good question that came through, and I think you may have addressed it a little bit in your presentation regarding the age of an animal um, and when uh, acupuncture services can be provided. Um, mm -hmm. Is it really a, an option for an animal of any age or should they be of a certain um, age or maturity level? Um, really can be done on any, any animal. Um, I honestly, I don't do a, a ton of it on puppies, you know, or smaller kittens. I don't do a lot on, on tinier, younger animals, typically because they're more healthy. Um, and there are other things that we can do. Uh, but no, really overall, it's safe for the vast majority of animals. And anytime that we're doing what we, I, anytime I'm doing acupuncture, I always do an examination first, a full physical exam, to make sure that it is safe to do for all parties and that it's appropriate. So overall safe, but you're gonna get an exam the first time anyway. So that's how we make sure. Okay, uh, and then uh, final question, because I know we're over, we wanna be conscious of everyone's time. Just regard, uh, regarding to your patient load, how many you see in a day, uh, opening up your own practice versus maybe coming in and consulting with someone else? Yeah, um, it varies. You know, it varies. For me, I, um, I'm i in practice, like in a physical hospital uh, some of the time, and I see regular, regular Western general appointments uh, in addition to acupuncture appointments, and so they're interspersed. Um, usually I'll see one or two acupuncture appointments per day um, because especially now with COVID and, and, and how things have changed, um, the focus has shifted more for emergent and urgent medicine when I'm in hospital. If I'm not in hospital because I do have a side business, Acupets, where I do mobile vet acupuncture, um, that really depends. There are some days I'll have you know, three patients, there are some days I'll have five, there'll be some days that I have one. And so it, it really varies. Um, like I said, COVID and, and all of that has uh, changed the, has kind of changed the the outlook of things just because going into people's homes is different these days and, and traveling to different hospitals is different. Um, but it's definitely a viable option as far as whether you want to bring that to a brick and mortar hospital or if you wanted to open up your own practice both of those are viable options okay and then just as a plug for the field of uh, acupuncture medicine uh do you see it as a field that's only trajecting up in the future you know 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, especially because like I said, the who, you know, the world health organization is encouraging integration of medicine, you know, and, uh, in human medicine and over the past decade, uh, there have been so many studies and, and the stigma of acupuncture and integrative medicine has really, you know, begun to dissipate. And I really, over the next five, 10 years, I think it's going to be pretty standard for acupuncture to be recommended. Similar to how like chiropractic is now kind of part of the conversation. Your back hurts, you talk about a chiropractor. You know, I have no doubt that it's going to be your back hurts, see a chiropractor, or maybe try some acupuncture. So, yeah. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. I know we went over a little bit. Uh, for everyone in the audience, uh, thank you so much for making this a special uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, as always, if you're in the audience and you're considering veterinary medicine and Ross University, feel free to reach out to our office. Uh, we'll be more than happy to work with you regarding uh, the school itself, the application process, and any admissions questions you have. Uh, so Dr. Fuentes, and to the audience, thank you uh, and have a great evening. Thanks. Bye.